So it's to eat. It's kind of my first step for people. Um, my main message in nutrition is actually my 10 principles of nutrition, which sort of outline the roadmap for understanding the physiology and to a degree psychology around nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't really want to sit down to 10 principles and learn them out of the gates. Oftentimes people are just looking to get started on nutrition. And so, as you know, you give them 10 principles that don't even list a single food, you know, it's not really seen as relevant. So how to actually apply all that knowledge, my first step for people is the 800 gram challenge. And the 800 gram challenge is to eat 800 grams by weight of the fruits and vegetables of their choice each day. And they continue to eat whatever else they want. And the fruits and vegetables no can be cooked, canned, frozen, or fresh. And they also include things like potatoes and beans and corn, um, avocado and olives. So some things that people probably would not necessarily consider fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Cooler Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kuehlhorn, and I'm excited to have you join me as I interview community members and business leaders from the communities in which I live, work, and serve through my business, Cooler Garage Doors. We're going to bring you highlights on characters in our communities. Why? Because community matters, and I want to know more about who is behind our business and leadership in order to understand and support the community fabric that our relationships make up. And collectively, we can build stronger communities that support our lifestyles, our youth, and our health. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Cooler Lifestyle Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Kuehlhorn. Today, I have the privilege of sitting down with E.C. Sinkowski. <laughs> she runs Optimize Me Nutrition. Um, what I've been really impressed by, E.C., outside of like learning from you already, you have the Consistency Project Podcast, well, which really boils down some potentially real tactical and... Yeah. Um, <laughs> heady type of information into real practicality stuff that we can use day by day. Mm -hmm. um, you have a bachelor's in biochemical engineering, two masters, one in environmental science and nutrition and functional medicine. So there's this in-depth context. You've been well, in CrossFit coaching on various levels. Um, I'm excited for for where our conversation can go, and it it just seems like you have this breadth of knowledge when it comes to health. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm excited to see where it goes as well. <laughs> yeah, right on. So I know from our previous conversation, you've spent time in Colorado, but you're no longer well, here. Where are you beaming in from? Uh, the East Coast. Yeah, went back home to Maryland area. Awesome, awesome. And where did you grow up? Maryland, yeah. So I'm back okay, home so after you are back spending home. some time in different areas, yeah. What brought you into this realm of nutrition and health? Uh, well, I don't really know. <laughs> it might be a little anticlimactic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have found that over the years, I really do like making the complex simple if I can. Um, so I think no there is a space for that in nutrition. I found that I did that... Um, in my career with environmental consulting, really under a guidance of my mentor at the time, who was exceptional at it for that field. I found that CrossFit did that for people in terms of how to get fit really effectively uh, without yeah, getting yeah, lost yeah. in the noise of, you know, all these details that probably don't matter for a lot of us. And then obviously with CrossFit, there was always this underpinning of nutrition and the importance of it. Um, and then with my bio background, it sort of was a natural transition, I guess. Um, and there's plenty to do in making the complex simple in nutrition. Absolutely. I love that, um, making the complex simple. I think that mm -hmm. is where a lot of people get stuck. I mean, they can so easily get overwhelmed in information. Yeah. So let's talk about that. I mean, how do we dissect that? How do we even start mm -hmm. making some of that complex simple? Yeah, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it with uh, my podcast saying that there was some really practical or tactical takeaways, which I'm happy to hear that that is totally the goal. I mean, as much as I love the science, a lot of times learning more about the science doesn't actually change our practical application, especially for 99% of us, um, that it really comes down to basics time and time again. And there's actually a recent documentary out on Netflix and 
typically I don't really love a lot of nutrition documentaries that come out on Netflix. But Netflix. right now, the one that's out there is on the blue zones, which are these areas in the yes. world where we find people tend to live to be 100. Yes. Now, I don't think that we need to mirror everything that they do. And we can talk about what is optimal and not and all of this other stuff. But one of the things I love, absolutely love about the blue zones is that when we look at why we think they're getting to these ages and why we think they have such a high quality of life and Dan Buettner identified these nine pillars that he thinks are, are the real driving factors behind their longevity and health. Three of them, less than half, are related to nutrition. <laughs> so there's six factors that have nothing to do with what you're eating. And I think, really you know, again, we can get so myopic on, you know, what's my protein intake level or what's the, what's the best source of non-dairy coffee creamer? And it's like, doesn't matter, guys. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Hey everybody, this is Luke from Cooler Garage Doors. Just want to take a quick second to talk about our sponsor, Sommer Garage Door Openers. We believe Sommers are the best in the business when it comes to garage door openers. We always recommend them for residential installs because of the many features they have, such as Wi-Fi connectivity and safety features like a fixed chain that runs along a secure rail for a quiet and safe operation. Click the link to find out more about Sommer garage door openers. That's beautiful. I love that you brought up the blue zones. Do you have yeah. a vision for how long you plan on living? <laughs> I know. I've actually never thought about that. <laughs> no. I did that. I, I put it like my number is 108. And I don't okay. know exactly why. But I wanted to be a little bit challenging. Like I have some longevity Whoa. in my family, but at the end of the day, I'm like, yeah, 108. I just like the number eight. But <laughs> wow, I'm like okay, yeah, I've you never know, actually it, thought about that. That's a question I've never heard. <laughs> as somebody, you know, for me, I love intentionality, and so no. you know, as my journey continues, how can I, you know, make a one percent improvement today that impacts tomorrow, no, no. and. And, and chunk it down. And one of the things, as I say, 108, I'm like, all right, um, you know, I'm 46. I'm not even halfway there. And if I'm really going to do this, like, how do I play for it? And I don't want to be like 108, like vegetable. I have this vision of me at 103, like up on stages, leading and guiding and, and like flexing. like. <laughs> right. And so right. nutrition goes into this. And I, and I just asked that because you know, even in the blue zones, I don't think those folks are necessarily like targeting an end of life time frame, but uh -huh. they are being pulled. And I think this is one of the nine pillars, right? Like purpose. Love him. Love him. Right? There's there's yep. a reason to to continue waking up and there's something that they're compelled to bring into the world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, in those pillars, what are the three nutrition components for the blue zones? Yeah, one is what they call plant slant. So to have a lot of plant matter in the diet. And um, I align with that as <laughs> so of my 800 gram challenge. Another yeah. one is related to quantity. It's actually, I believe, from the Japanese Okinawa culture, but there's a word for it that's escaping me right now. But it's the idea of stopping when you're 80% full. Yes. And then the third one, interestingly enough, is related to alcohol and encouraging moderate alcohol consumption. I think that's one that Good. we can often fixate on to our detriment and be like, oh, see, alcohol is healthy. And it's like, no, actually, not really. The reason I believe that they pull off alcohol, which is not really a healthy addition to the diet, although it can be part of a healthy diet as they demonstrate, is simply the way that they consume it. It's around family dinners. It's around social gatherings. It's in a totally different approach to drinking alcohol than kind of more of, um, you know, a binge culture or like, I'm going to save up all my drinks for Saturday. <laughs> it's just much more of right. a moderate approach. And so I think that's really the the health secret behind their alcohol consumption. But yeah, so those are the three that have anything to do with um, diet. Really? All right. This is a, a side question that just pops up because I well, relate it to your 100 or your 800 gram challenge and in, in eating plants. Um, but Definitely. in your realm and in your teachings with regards to nutrition, how is breath incorporated? Is it mm. 
breathing? As far as, yeah, intentional breathing, whether it's mm-hmm. breath work or being mindful of breathing through the nose or, or what have you. Is well, there a component that you bring in with breath? Not really. Um, I don't think I've ever actually talked about that or educated about that. Um, I think there might be some tangential breath work done via my nutrition in the sense that I think a lot of what I have been able to bring for people is calming down a little bit of the neuroses around food, calming down some of the stress points around food. So I certainly don't go in with it as like I want them to breathe more deeply or calmly. That's not sort of what I'm thinking about. But I do find that we have a very, at least people that I work with have a very kind of hyper- uh, awareness of food to the detriment of their overall stress levels um, and to their overall health, to be perfectly honest. And so taking yeah. away some of that dogma and the reactivity that we might have in social media land from fear mongering um, is, is certainly something I enjoy helping people with. I love that. The reason I bring up that was I was just listening to a podcast and um, the gentleman's name is James, uh, uh, where's his last name? He's got a book called Breath, New York Best Times, right. uh, James Nestor. Right. And in this conversation, he was talking about airways and there's a significant skeletal shift in humans around the Industrial Revolution. And basically when we have packaged foods that are mm-hmm. high caloric, less plants, they require less you know, okay. of our of our jaws and and so our airways actually became smaller by design. Sure. And it's just fascinating to me. So like going into plants, I'd love for you to explain the 100 or 800 gram challenge and, and why this matters. Um, yeah. Because again, it is taking this complex and, and boiling it down pretty simple. Eat 800 grams yeah. of, of plants and veggies, right? Like, yeah. Tell me more. Yeah, so it's to eat. It's kind of my first step for people. Um, my main message in nutrition is actually my ten principles of nutrition, which sort of outline the roadmap for understanding the physiology and, to a degree, psychology around nutrition. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't really want to sit down to ten principles and learn them out of the gates. So oftentimes, people are just looking to get started on nutrition, and so you know, you give them ten principles that don't even list a single food. You know, it's not really seen as relevant. So how to actually apply all that knowledge, my first step for people is the 800 gram challenge. And the 800 gram challenge is to eat 800 grams by weight of the fruits and vegetables of their choice each day. And they continue to eat whatever else they want. And the fruits and vegetables can be cooked, canned, frozen, or fresh. And they also include things like potatoes and beans and corn, um, avocado and olives. So some things that people probably would not necessarily consider fruits and vegetables. And that 800 gram number actually came from a study. So I had this idea in my mind for some time of how does somebody measure quality in the diet? You know, when you say that you're eating clean, what does that really mean? And can we measure it? And so that idea had been floating around with me for some time. And it was during my master's in nutrition, I happened to come across this study. And they were looking at, okay, how many fruits and vegetables do people eat? And then what happens to them in terms of death or disease? And it was a meta-analysis, meaning they were actually pulling together research from lots of different studies, and in fact, 95 different studies. So they had thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of people in the study, which is a nice cross-section. Yes, yes. And no surprise, they found that at 800 grams, the risk of, let's see, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, and all causes of dying went down. And so reading that article with kind of the, the line of thought that I had been having previously, I was like, ah, that's interesting. What if I try to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables each day? with no other rules and restrictions and see what happened. So that was probably spring or summer 2017. And then I spent uh, kind of six months testing it on my own, implementing it, looking at the data, what would be the rules? What are the calories? What are the macros? What does this do? And ultimately I found it was just a really nice way to ensure that I was getting a healthy daily dose of fruits and veggies without being so obsessive, which I found with so many other diets of like restricting this and this is the best fruit and all this other baloney. Um, when in honesty, 80 to 90% of people aren't eating enough fruits and vegetables. And so it's just like, we got to get people kind of an easier system to accomplish this outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some images on your website and potentially Instagram, your social on what 800 gram looks like. 
Uh-huh. And you're, we're talking a plate, like a dinner plate okay. of fruit and veggies. Yep. Yeah, it fits on, on a standard dinner plate. You're not going to want to eat it all at dinner. You're going to want to spread you it should. out. And yeah. that's also the, about the equivalent of about six cups. So that's another way to think about it. And a closed adult fist is about the size of a cup. So that's a great way that people can just kind of get started on it, even just do a hand-eye measurement to get started yeah, and um, before worrying about all the specifics. Yeah. Yeah. So super easy. On the psychology component, like what do you think inhibits people from making healthy life changes, whether it's to adopt a simple 800 gram challenge or to go into, I mean, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it as that. What what have you found? Like what's inhibiting folks from Uh, living healthy? Our environment's a huge one. I mean, you can't go anywhere and be completely surrounded by calorically dense processed food, which is definitely delicious and tempting. And we like the dopamine response from it. So there's some very real biological triggers for this stuff. Um, And there's very few people who don't actually like that stuff. I mean, I think some of us, some people we can learn not to fall for the cravings, right? Or the, the, the cues. But I think a lot of us actually really enjoy those foods. So one, we have this biological want for these foods. Two, it's all around us constantly. So that's a big, huge factor, huge. Um, and in fact, I think that's some of the the real way that we're going to get out of this is controlling the environment on a, on a more wide scale than anything. Anyway. I also think there's just a ton of poor nutrition information out there. I fell for it myself, which is somewhat embarrassing to admit now, but I thought fruit at some point had too much sugar. I believed that, you know, seed oils or vegetable oils are killing us. And there's all these other topics I believed as well. And when you actually go to the, you know, peer reviewed literature, you find the complete opposite. Um, And so there's just a lot of kind of gimmicks and hacks out there that people are falling for. Um, And so that's getting in the way. And then ultimately when they do these gimmicks and hacks and the overly restrictive diets, and they don't get the results they want. We then have this identity with failure and it just makes each new attempt harder and harder. And I don't want to say that the 800 gram challenge is the most perfect diet, but one of the things it does for people is it totally removes so much of what they've dealt with before. It removes the idea of restriction. It removes the idea of, you know, perfection. And so allowing the person to win in nutrition is huge. And that's while the fruits and veggies have a a massive health component and we can do a lot with weight and we can add all these vitamins and um, minerals and fiber to the person's diet. What we're also doing is giving them a win. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I love that. I'd love to get your perspective on, I'm going to call them supplements. I don't necessarily think they're supplements in that, in a, in the real definition, but I'm thinking of like the shakes and or green drinks one can buy and it's powdered, but it has all the superfoods and certain cal- calories in there and, um, you know, maybe even adaptogens with, with different mushrooms. How does that play into nutrition? Like, is that something people fall for? Is it, is it really substantial well, for a rounded diet? Most of it is not necessary. Um, you know, you, you said adaptogens, which we would ha- kind of have to put out of the side conversation. So I'm going to start with kind of the powdered greens or reds or any of these yeah. juice plus type, whatever green, you know, these are your veggies, but it's easier to do. Right. Um, yeah, you're not going to get the results you want from that. They're, they're not inherently harmful. Of course, supplements aren't that regulated. So there is some interesting things there. Again, separate conversation. Yeah. They are inherently help- harmful in the sense of, okay, dried veggies are fine. But what you're missing is the whole satiety. You're missing the whole chewing. You're missing the whole, now I have this thing in my stomach that's just sitting there and the thing in my stomach sitting there is actually making me feel full and therefore I will not overeat all these other processed foods that are all around me. And that's what people are missing. So they don't get the balance of quantity and quality, right? They have this green powdered shake and they're not full. And so now, yeah, they've had some vitamins and minerals, but they still have too much room to fill up on the calorically dense processed stuff. The actual chewing of food and the actual fiber and having it, your body has to digest it and take the time for it to do so is part of satiety and is part of the way that we control quantity in the diet. And so you might be getting better quality by adding some of those things, but you haven't figured out the best solution for uh, quantity control, which is the whole foods. Yes. 
That's amazing. I can only imagine there's there's other stuff that's hard to see, whether it's, you know, while chewing, we're almost forced to breathe through our nasal cavity. There's there's so many little intricacies as I go deeper and deeper into understanding life and, and exploring life. Like the idea of humming has some benefits. The idea of, of chewing, um, being able to put this fibrous material into our bodies, like has benefits besides just eating veggies. <laughs> it goes into some, some depth of complexity, but the solution mm-hmm. is relatively simple. I mean, I can think of, you know, humans and in our past, like we were foraging, we were eating these raw materials. Why change that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, I think there, it's, it's a hard line. I think um, where we go a little astray is a little bit too much romanticism on natural is always better. I think we have to evaluate that there's going to be some things about natural and paleo that was better. And then there are some things that are now and present that are better. Instead yeah. of always being like, oh, I want to go back to paleo era. I mean, I am sure if we asked <laughs> our ancestors when they would rather live, they would choose now. <laughs> they would choose now. Um, so I think there's some tenants and some through lines, but I think that it also can become a little bit... Um, oh, everything they did was more optimal. And it's like, no, not necessarily. And I think protein powder is a great example of that. That's an industrial food, if you will, which is quite healthy and is not, we're not consuming it to the detriment of our health. You know, it's yeah, processed, oh gosh, processed, right? And, you know, it might have some additives and it's like, okay, but it's not the food to fear. And then of course, you know, we could go in the conventional medicine sphere and, and look at all of the wonderful things that conventional medicine can do for us, right? So we can't just sort of take this idea that natural is always better. We have to look at the end result. How are we consuming this product? Is it to actually help? Is it not so great? And so that's where a great example of like, okay, the powdered greens, we we tend not to get a better outcome. So therefore not a great industrial project, uh, product, protein powder. I really haven't worked with anybody who's like consuming too much protein powder (laughs) um, to the detriment of their outcomes. And so it's like, okay, that's a great product, right? Yeah. I love that. Okay. Calories, macros. Can you define and, and maybe even, um, because it, it still is confusing to me to understand macros in the sense of nutrition. Like I understand it's a carbohydrate, it's a protein, it's a fat. Um, how do I, take that and put it into some practicality along with calories and where this is like in me personally I, I realized um I've I've great fortune of having high metabolism I also live very active and it's very difficult for me to add anything and at this stage in life I'm like okay maybe I want to add five pounds of muscle gain no. be very specific there and then I was looking at my caloric intake and without having a really refined measurement, I was like, yeah, I'm probably like not eating nearly enough because I'll skip lunches or whatever. All that to say that it's, it's brought onto my radar. And then as I'm talking to folks, they're like, yeah, focus on your macros. And I'm like, okay, but what does that really mean? So I'm, I'm interested just from your perspective, EC calories, what does it really mean? Is there any defined, like, is it the 2000 caloric intake a day that we're aiming for and what types and how does that play in with macros and we dissect that a little bit for folks? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So my first principle of nutrition is, uh, you know, the quantity of food you eat in terms of calories controls your body weight. And then my second principle is the quantity of food you eat in terms of macronutrients controls your body composition. So both of them are a thing. And both of them are related. You cannot have one without the other. If you're counting macros, you're counting calories. If you're counting calories, they're made up of some macronutrients. Um, And so they're both a measurement of quantity. When you pay attention to how your calories are split into macronutrients, you do get a little bit finer control over aesthetic outcomes as well as performance outcomes. And so that's (laughs) typically of interest to people. Like when people want to gain weight, they typically are talking about gaining muscle. Very few. I don't think I've worked with anybody who's like, no, no, I, I want it as fat. Yeah. So that's when we want to start looking at how those calories are split. But calories are just a measure of energy that's contained within the macronutrients because your body can use protein, carbs, and fat for energy. 
yes, yes. but yet when you take in protein, carbs, and fat for energy, or when you take in protein, carbs, and fat as food, your body might not use them for energy depending what the needs are. And we find that the macros have different uses. So if I take in an excess amount of protein, my body will certainly use that for energy. But if I don't take in enough protein, then my body's got to use that to make hormones and um, transport proteins and skin and nails. And so it's going to say, okay, I'm not using the protein for energy. I'm going to use the carbs and the fat for energy. Or the yeah, fat absolutely. might come in and your body might go, okay, I need to help you know make cholesterol with that. And so we're not going to use that for energy. We're going to look for the carbs for energy. And so there is a little bit of preference for how your body is going to use this, um, the different materials coming in. But we give them a value of energy because they all could be used for energy depending on what our fuel source coming in is. Yes, yes. Awesome. My understanding is you do have courses that people can jump into. And I was checking out one of them. And honestly, what gave me pause was getting a, a gram scale and, and measuring out everything <laughs> that I eat. Um, I will be ready for that, EC. <laughs> I will, yeah. I will get there. Um, but what I'm teeing up is the question of like, let's say there's some listeners out here and this peaks a nerve and they get agitated and they want to take some action. There is so much complex information out there. There's so many folks marketing and, and, and pushing out things that have benefits or detriments or, or whatever. Well, so this is this is a tip. I definitely want to offer some time and, and make sure people know how to to reach out to you. But um, in the sense of just like general information, like where would you guide folks to even start? Um, and, and how much time does one put in to really start sifting through the information? Or is it just right. like this journey? And <laughs> you know what I'm asking? Like there's so much. Um, yeah, it's so easy to get into one thing or another, and maybe that's part of people's journeys to go try it out and say this yeah. works or this doesn't. But at the same time, um, are there different resources, or is there amount of hours to go in and, and research stuff? Um, where would somebody start? I mean, I think they should start with the eight hundred gram challenge, um, but that's my biased approach. Um, I yeah. think. I think you the red flags for people should be if mm -hmm. they feel like they've learned some new secret from somebody online, that is the red flag not to go down that rabbit hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, oh my gosh, Definitely. everything I thought I knew was wrong is actually probably wrong information. The stuff that works is the unbelievably boring basics of fruits and vegetables and calorie control and maybe for my athletes yes, a little yes. more protein and looking at you know a little more carb to fat ratio yes, well, done we're done <laughs> yeah we're done and so yeah. i think what happens and again it happened to me so I'm, I'm i'm empathetic of how powerful social media can be but you you know you like or something or you get entertained by something or you happen to catch your eye and you're pulled into this rabbit hole of a lot of information which is completely irrelevant and not needed um and it's hard to get out of it. And so I would just like, I don't know, warn people, but it's sort of like, you really don't need a lot of this stuff. Nutrition in practice is remarkably, a successful nutrition in practice is remarkably boring and remarkably basic. Um, you don't need a lot of new stuff. And, and that's actually something you said, you know, I, I want to continue to pursue the 1% better. I would actually argue nutrition, there is no 1% better. There is a point at which you've done enough and you're done. And it's time and, to go, you know, I don't know, pick up a new hobby or worry about some other factor in your life that might not be going as well. There is no one, more 1% one really? better. There is a point at which you are healthy enough and you're doing enough. And again, that's what I love the blue zone. They're, they're not 1% biohacking. <laughs> right. At all. Right. At all. And so I guess that's what I would try to, you know, look for some really basic stuff. Now, I know that my approach isn't the only successful approach. But there's plenty of people who have, are preaching the basics and putting out good information and they just don't get the attention because it's not controversial. And that's, you know, not really what kind of our current media and social media favors. What a great perspective. I really appreciate well, that you bring that up yeah. because the same thing applies in, in just of almost every facet of life. Yeah. Like, and, and it goes to your consistency project. It's staying yeah. consistent. I mean, even great business is boring. <laughs> And the, yeah. there's so much of the bells and whistles and social and, and marketing, like that's 
the intent is to get attention and awareness, but at the same time, the basics are the basics. Totally. Eat fruits and veggies. Chew. Have some breathe. protein. Don't eat too many calories. Yeah. Yep. Done. Done. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> EC, how do folks find you and learn from you? Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Consistency Project, so thank you for that. That's my podcast, Optimize Me Nutrition, on the different social channels. And I do have a masterclass, and yes, you do have to weigh and measure. Um, I would say that, actually, that actually goes back to your last question. You kind of said how many hours and stuff. If people, it doesn't have to be with me, but if people really dig into weighing and measuring their food for a period of time, I think it provides them a a lifetime of freedom in terms of nutrition. So it's almost like, yeah. you, what is that phrase? You have to go through it, right? Like the only way out is through or something. And it's like the same yeah. thing with nutrition. Yeah. The endpoints you want are based on quantitative endpoints. They're based on calories, macros, and micros. So we got to weigh them. We got to weigh them. We got to figure out what they are. So anyway, that was sort of yes, wrapping yes. back to your other thing. I, I think the effort is worth the outcome. And they can do that with my masterclass. But again, it's sort of more of the principle of, of that's really where you're going to a lot of value not necessarily becoming an expert in nutrition if you don't have the time to become the expert in nutrition, right? Yes, 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 yes. I love that. We'll include um, social handles, your website, I, oh. Consistency Project in our show wow. notes. And I really do encourage listeners to go check out your information. Um, I will be jumping in on the masterclass and weighing my food because I'm very curious when I opened I that up initially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did. And I could just imagine the awareness that comes about through that experience. Like, totally. That, that's, that's such a big I mean, piece. a really well done weighing and measuring period of time is, in my opinion, the best education you can give yourself. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, as much as I love my podcast, <laughs> you could spend that time doing the weighing and measuring, and it's going to trump all the stuff you take away from that. Beautiful. All right. I'm sold. Awesome. Thank Listeners, you. Listeners, join me. Let's go weigh our food <laughs> and uh, and learn more. EC, I really appreciate this conversation. Thanks so much. To some yeah, thank you much. Thank you. Yeah. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to the Cooler Lifestyle Podcast. We count on your subscriptions, your likes, your shares, and I encourage you to do that now. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe. Lower right-hand button. If you're on audio, download this, share it, and we look forward to having you on the next one.